I was struck by the diction. I was struck by the amazing, uh, 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 evocative uh, nature of the prose, the diction. Who who do I give credit to? Do I give credit to the translator? Um, do I should I give credit to Homer for the ideas and for the stories and for his sense of history and and myth and tradition, or or when I'm when I am lingering over a sentence and just marveling over you chose the exact right word to convey emotion and experience. Is that Homer? Is that Fagels? Is that Fitzpatrick? What a great question. Uh, and so, so difficult to answer. It is, a, it is a long question in literary studies, the question of translation theory, right? Um, obviously, when we read a, an English translation of the Odyssey, we are not, or the Iliad, we are not reading or hearing the sounds of Homer's words as they would have been heard and recited by the Greeks. Um, maybe a good place to start in answering that question is with the debate conducted between uh, Matthew Arnold, the famous uh, English poet and, and professor of poetry at Oxford, um, and one of his predecessors in, in translating Homer, a man named Newman. Um, there is a long series of lectures and on the part of Arnold and responses on the part of Newman basically arguing over what's your job as a translator? What are you trying to give to the reader? Um, and it's interestingly kind of bound up with the advent of uh, classical poetry as a feature of, of world literature rather than the study of classics. Classics is becoming less central as a part of the education of uh, Western mind. And Homer is being shifted into the world of the history of the canon writ large, which is sort of relevant to, to you know, this very podcast. Um, because of that, translations of Homer are becoming important. It's no longer the case that in order to appreciate Homer, it's feasible to demand that one learn Greek and read Greek. Um, now, Newman, I believe it is, has a sense of Homer as the kind of noble savage, in the sense that he was a childlike, pre-cultural sage. And his experience of encountering Homeric poetry is, is an experience of alienation. It's an experience of a sort of primitive diction uh, and a simplicity, which he has translated with the English bard uh, verse, with kind of the verse of balladeers. Um, and, and that gives a very particular and kind of homespun sound to his translation. Matthew Arnold disagrees entirely and essentially argues that what you're hearing in Homer when you encounter, encounter the original Greek is uh, a robust, firm, manly, simple voice. Uh, and that that's the kind of central aesthetic experience of reading Homer, and so translations should reflect that. Now, both parties in this debate agree that the point of translation is in some sense to preserve the aesthetic and qualitative experience of reading Homer's original words. Uh, and so Fitzgerald, uh, Lattimore, Fagels most recently, their translations, I think, in many cases, aim to accomplish that goal, which is to say to get you not the original words of the poem, but at least the original experience of, of reading the poem. Um, now, ultimately, that's almost an impossible project, that every word in every language is slightly different from every other word, and words in between different languages are different from one another. On top of that, Homeric poetry is written in a language that has very, very different structural and stylistic possibilities than ours. For one thing, as I think we said at the beginning, Greek is a tonal language. It has three pitch accents that dictate where the voice is, whether the voice is supposed to rise and fall. Uh, and whereas in English, meter works with stress. So if you take, for example, Tennyson's poem, Ulysses, right? It little profits that an idle king. This is iambic pentameter with, with force put upon each uh, stressed syllable. In Greek, what you have is a, um, a kind of structure of duration. So long syllables actually last longer and short syllables are pronounced more quickly. So the first line of the Iliad, yeah, these are, these, this is a kind of musical rhythm. And so when you put that into English, you have to really account for the fact that an English reader isn't going to automatically read the words in those ways. All of that being said, there is a sort of fundamental thing that you can do, which is 
try as best as possible to find the English word that reflects what, what you're very rightly describing, which is Homer's pinpoint accuracy for finding the, the word that is going to tell you exactly what's happening. He has an immensely rich and complicated vocabulary for what the Greeks might have called enargeia, the vividness of hearing or seeing a battle, um, communicating it to you as if you were sensorily there. And I think that some of the more modern translations that we have do this very well. Um, I like to think of, of Homeric verse, which is in dactylic hexameter as hoofbeats and heartbeats. You get this kind of da 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 and there's a real sense of, of onward drive and forward motion that I think any good translation would have to, to capture. But who do you give credit to? I think ultimately Homer, uh, but it's always going to be a kind of collaboration between Homer and the, and the translator who's hopefully aiming to give you as faithfully as possible what, what Homer gives you. So we're doing the so we're doing the Odyssey next uh, next month next episode, and I'm wondering if you could recommend a translation of the Odyssey. Um, so I, I've been told by a by a colleague that I should do uh, Seamus Haney, and huh. then I was told by a friend that that's crazy, absolutely not. What 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 would you suggest? Yeah, great question. I mean, you're going to get different answers from different people because this is going to be a matter of taste in many ways. Um, Haney is a fine, fine poet, of course, or I suppose I should say was. Uh, his translation of Beowulf I found deeply moving and powerful. But That's the one I, I read, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And interestingly, uh, that poem for me, the, the power of that translation for me is in Haney's kind of connection to... Um, the long poetic history of, of English poetry, that right. is poetry on the British Isles. Um, I've not read his Odyssey, so I don't know if he has the same affinity for Greek verse. I will say that in my own estimation, the, the most recent, the Fagel's translation, is a marvelous piece of work. I think one thing that we don't often think about when we think about translations is they do date because language changes. And so the words that have the right connotations for, say, Pope, who wrote one of the great translations of Homer, aren't going to be the same as the words that have the right connotations for us, for a modern audience. So there's value to be had in, in reading the most recent good translation, um, which is the reason why I would recommend Fagel's. But, you, you know, you can't go wrong with Fitzgerald and, and Lattimore. These are, these are good, solid, old options. And if you're interested in kind of the history of translation, Pope is a, is a really interesting uh, person to read as well. But my vote's for Fagel. 